But Tallinnally is my ancestral home, and the family have been there in Westmeath for 10 generations. And they were an agile lot. They started with the, um, the, with the king, Charles I, and then moved to Parliament with Cromwell, then back to the king, Charles II, and then uh, uh, away from the James I, uh, James II, rather, to um, William and Mary. In other words, they were keeping always ahead of the trouble and on the winning side. And right on up to modern times, when I'm glad to say my uncle, who was the last um, Lord Longford to live in the house before me, and he was a passionate Irish nationalist, a strong supporter of de Valera and, um, and, and a senator in the, in the uh, Irish Senate. Anyway, uh, the collection of documents that have been uh, uh, digitalised now is a wonderful project. I'm so delighted to be involved. And... Um, uh, I'd start by telling you a little bit about the the map side. The maps are quite um, are quite battered. Some of them are really hardly readable, but others are beautifully uh, preserved. And the, the first one of all, as far as I know, is the 1767 map of the estate at Kalukan in Westmeath, which was their biggest. They had four estates in all. Uh, at Tallinnale in Castle Pollard, at Kalukan in also Westmead, in Longford itself, in the county, in the town, and on, on a building estate at Dunleary. And it was that, the building of Dunleary, which really kept them going. And I think uh, uh, the house might well have disappeared by now if it hadn't been for that. Anyway, going back to the map, the first one is 1767, uh, uh, made by... Uh, uh, a man who became a very famous map maker in Ireland. He was a Huguenot by origin, and he'd come over from uh, France um, in the early 18th century, and he was a pupil of the famous uh, uh, John Rock, and, uh, uh, and eventually became a brother-in-law, married his sister. So this is our first map, and it's beautifully, there are two versions, beautiful bound volume in watercolours of the map made for the Lord Longford of the time, 1767. But there are numerous, probably up to a hundred other maps, and the most interesting are the ones that predate the Ordnance Survey. Because, of course, after the Ordnance Survey, which begins in Ireland about 1835, after that, uh, privately made maps are, are, are of much less interest because the Ordnance Survey is so beautifully done, and you can look up any estate and see it developing using the various um, versions of the Ordnance Survey. They, uh, chronologically, they came roughly every 20, 30 years. Wage books were also very rich in. Uh, I, I think nowadays uh, it doesn't get put in a book. Well, it's all on a computer. But in those days, they had these really fine volumes, which you might think was a diary or something. Here's an example. And this is one a wage book dating from the uh, just uh, the first few uh, weeks of the First World War, so it's October 1914. And you see here on the left-hand column uh, 50, over 50 names of people, many of whose descendants are still very much alive and living in, in Westmeath or other parts of Ireland, or maybe they've spread across the world, but they're the ones who I know, uh, probably I knew their grandchildren, grandchildren Johnny Craig, James Griffith, um, uh, 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 the, the um, Fagans, there are lots and lots of Fagans, Fitzsimons, Achievers, Smiths, and so on. Now, uh, it's set out with these series of columns, and you'll see that each one represents a day of the week. So we can... If we wanted to know what, say, Richard Fitzsimons was doing, he spent the whole week on avenues and he earned a shilling and fourpence a day, not a great fortune. Um, he, uh, then if we looked at, at, at um, Johnny Craig, he earned, he was on the yard cattle, that's the, the am I reading, yes, the yard cattle, that would be the car, uh, cattle had already been put in, in the yards in October. 
And then um, William Cheevers was had a more interesting week because on Monday he was threshing, on Tuesday he was doing potatoes, and on Thursday he was grubbing, and on Friday, no, Saturday, they worked six days a week, the Saturday work, he was, he appeared to be digging out the local tank, whatever that was. But you get a very good um, picture of the estate, the home farm that is, in these wage books. And now I haven't counted them, but I think in all, starting with the 18th century, the first wage books date from the 1780s and going right up to the modern times and the 1960s and uh, up to the time when I inherited in 1961. It, it's quite a problem when you have a modern file, do you keep it or is it going to live forever on the, in the, in the um, digital form? Uh, perhaps paper files are being all thrown away now and we're relying on digital ones. But certainly the, this um, hoard of, uh, of books and documents of various kinds, ledgers, wage books, uh, they would have kept them for the same reason that we, everybody keeps archives because it might be needed in the immediate past. And then unless they're actually thrown away, they become historical objects. And I think what is very exciting is that the, uh, the treasure hunt people, many people have of trying to find out who their relations were, where they lived, what happened to them, what they did, uh, how long they lived even. And the answers to all those genealogical questions may well be in a ledger like this, because here we have a man with a name and he's working on the estate and we know his date and it's probably traceable by going back to identify which of the Fitzsimons family that was or which of the Fagans, although those names are very common names. Um, I'm not a genealogist, but I know how passionately people feel and I'm delighted to be able to help and put our archives at their disposal.